السلام عليكم صباح الخير um, thank you دكتور عبد الهادي إن you joined us today وشكرا للأتنديز اللي حاضرين حاليا إذا حاب تبدأ الحين دكتور عبد الهادي you can uh, بالنسبة للدكتور عبد الهادي he is one of the doctors اللي إحنا نتشرف بوجوده uh, he's joining us مع الدرم كلب he's always giving really great talks وأتمنى لجميع الحضور إنه ده يستفيدون معاه اليوم Uh, Dr. Abdul Hadi, mics to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Honestly, the, uh, the honor is mine. And uh, sorry, guys, if I sound a bit sleepy, it's uh, 3 a.m. here, and I actually woke up like 30 minutes ago. Uh, so thank you so much for the invitation. And I know, guys, you yesterday you had... Um, a part about talking about the references and research in general. So hopefully today we're gonna add more to it and we're gonna learn more about how to write a case report and case series. The way I formatted this presentation is basically, um, I put them both together because they are similar. However, in case series, sometimes you, the changes are only in the, uh, the case presentation. All right. So um, I love research a lot. I did my master in uh, biostat and epidemiology, and uh, this is from where I get most of my um, experience of research. I do not have any conflict of interest to declare. And the content of this presentation is we're gonna start by learning about the importance of documenting case report or case series in medical practice. And then I want you guys to learn how to identify or recognize a very um, publishable case from clinical practice, and then how to write a proper case report or case series, and finally about the publication process. So I'm pretty sure guys, you've seen this yesterday, it's the pyramid of evidence. And you have to know that on top of the evidence is basically a meta-analysis of many randomized controlled trials. But I intentionally use this pyramid of evidence because it has this arrow on the side that shows you that going to the top of the pyramid uh, needs a base. For example, you can't just start a, meta, um, a clinical trial of medication without at least knowing that this medication has some efficacy because of course these um, clinical trials are very costly and time consuming. And eventually you can do a meta-analysis on these clinical trials if you don't have clinical trials. And then basically it all starts from publishing a case report about an observation for uh, you having a very successful experience with one of the medication and reporting your clinical experience. And after that, people start doing more uh, studies to test this medication and find that it's efficacious in fact. So what do I have to write? Um, or why do I have a case, sorry, it's why. Why do I have to write a case report or case series? So it's easy and fast. The other thing, it's very helpful to medical students who do have um, dermatology elective, which is a limited exposure time. And it's very important to strengthen their application when they're applying for dermatology residency. The other thing, it's one of the research requirements. I heard in Saudi Arabia, it's one of the research requirements. And also, you know, when you apply to North American programs in dermatology, from my experience, basically research is one of the uh, requirement. And this is one of the uh, things that they look at when they review your CV. So research or in general research experience uh, has some weight during um, uh, ordering the applicants who is uh, better than the other. So usually I summarize the whole process in very simple five steps. Start with recognize, search, collect, write, and finally submit. I'm just gonna keep my eye on the question Q&A because I just wanna make sure that you guys um, are following. And if you have any questions, please let me know. I'm happy to stop. If you guys wanna do questions while I'm presenting, that's great or if you have more questions, we'll look at them at the end of the presentation. So we'll start with the first step, which is recognition. And I think this is the most difficult step because for two reasons. The first reason is if you're a medical student and you're having a limited exposure time in dermatology, 
it's really hard to recognize a publishable case because for recognition, you actually the definition of recognition is identification of someone or something from previous encounter on, or knowledge. So if you do not have any knowledge in dermatology and you've never had any previous encounter or exposure to dermatology, it's extremely hard to recognize a publishable case, which makes sense. Uh, so for that step, usually you need help from um, a consultant or a senior resident, uh, someone who has experience in dermatology. For example, a, a staff or a consultant who's working in dermatology for like many months or years, I'm pretty sure he encountered a couple of rare case reports and may, may not have the time to um, publish them. I know some of, honestly, of the staffs, even in Saudi Arabia, what they do is they have a notebook where they write uh, interesting cases in case some of the medical students rotated with them and they're interested in writing something, uh, they give them a case report. So this is something good and I also plan to do this in my future. Uh, what should I choose to write about? So if you go to any workshop on writing a case report or case series, you will see these topics. So the first thing is write about something rare. Rare disease in dermatology is going to be a rare genome dermatology disease or rare tumor. Um, unusual presentation of common disease. What does that mean? It means that, you know, uh, for example, um, we have a disease that's commonly present on the face, but you've seen a case that with the same disease that present on the leg, for example, that's unusual presentation of a common disease that is known to present on the face. A new association of a common disease. For example, you've noticed that patients with, uh, with psoriasis, for example, have um, more cardiovascular risk, which was actually uh, an observation initially before uh, being documented in more higher uh, evidence studies, uh, that they have more risk of developing cardiac events, for example. Um, you've noticed that patients with um, atopic dermatitis have, um, you know, higher risk of developing certain malignancy. That's just a general example. So this is a new association of a common disease that we see all the time. Positive response to treatment. They say that you have a patient um, that you treated with treatment A, treatment B, treatment C, but there is no other treatment in the book. So you try the treatment based on the pathogenesis, understanding the pathogenesis of the disease and knowing the mechanism of the medication. And you've noticed that, oh, this medication works. Or sometimes what it happens, which is most of the time that the patient takes the medication for another reason, and then the rash or their dermatological disease improves. So that's a positive response to treatment. So this is something you could actually publish. And then unusual side effect of the medication. We know that medications go through uh, phases of clinical trials. And we know that after completing the third phase, we have the fourth phase, which basically it's the post-market phase, where we test the, um, where we give the medication on a higher number of people. So there is a higher chance of seeing the unusual rare side effects. So if you encounter a rash with certain medication, um, especially the new medications, so this is something publishable. Um, let me guys know if you have any questions about the recognition. We'll go over a lot of examples just to understand. So this entity, that is uh, most of my examples for today are dermatology. I'm not sure if there are any people <laughs> from none the, the dermatology field, but I tried to put everything um, dermatology related in this talk. So if you have a patient with poro um, keratotic ecrine osteal and dermal duct nevus, which is the nevus that you see, it's not super rare, so we see. So for, but usually the treatment, if you look at the book, you will see that it's mostly uh, keratolytic agents, like creams that thins the skin to help. So with this patient, we tried doing CO2 ablative laser, which is a laser that removes the upper layer of the skin. So we saw a great improvement on this patient and we published this. So, so this is a great response to a treatment. This is another uh, great response to the treatment. So basically me and my colleague, we saw that there was a publication in the literature about trying naltrexone, which is an oral medication uh, with a very low dose with the addition of magnesium in patients with Dadier. And then we were, you know what, Dadier pathogenesis somehow similar to um, Haley Haley. And we had a patient with a really refractory Haley Haley. So we decided to try this regimen on this patient and it worked very well. So we published this observation. So the point that I'm trying to say here from this case report, so if you wanna really know the real efficacy of this, you should do it in a well-controlled, randomized controlled trial. 
But unfortunately, because this medication is cheap and it's not expensive, so people who like to do randomized controlled trial will, likes to do it on really, you know, like expensive biologic because it will come with the benefit in the future. Uh, we see Stephen Johnson and SGS, and we know that is uh, SGS and TN, and we know this is one of the uh, derm emergency. And you know that usually we treat this condition with either cyclosporin or anti tnf alpha or sometimes IVIG. So we have this patient who had really refractory oral ulcerations and she wasn't able to tolerate the oral cyclosporin. So we tried IV cyclosporin in that case and it worked very well. So we published this uh, regimen of how to dose because the dose is different. So we published this observation and it's, I think it's very helpful if someone would encounter a patient with SGS and we want to start the patient on cyclosporin and not able to because of the oral ulceration, then he could look up our publication and see how we actually uh, dose the IV. Uh, Microcystic and exit carcinoma, I did this when I was a med student with Dr. Hausawi from uh, Saudi Arabia. So basically, um, Macrocystic and exit carcinoma is one of the tumors that usually uh, sun related. And for that reason, it usually comes on the sun exposed sites on the skin, so face, uh, hands. But we've seen this patient with uh, sun protected uh, area, which was the thigh. So that was something publishable. So here we come to the point that we see a tumor in unusual presentation or unusual location. Uh, we know that keloids is very common and patients of uh, African ethnicity because going back in the history and the body protective uh, mechanism uh, against oncosarcosis, they have this tendency to develop keloid tissue. So we know, and usually we see keloids in patients who develop trauma, but we have this patient who developed an eruptive um, spontaneous keloids without any history of trauma or surgery. So keloids is common, we see it all the time. If you just publish a case of keloid, nobody will accept it. But this presentation of a very extensive keloids without any known trigger or trauma, so that's unusual presentation. So that's something publishable. And actually, it's been published in a lot of um, syndromes. I published this case with my colleague in neurology. And uh, usually, when we see herpes zoster or thalpicus, one of the unusual um, uh, complication is having an unilateral sixth uh, nerve palsy. So this is also another publishable case. And sometimes you can see something super rare. Like I, I'm not expected to see another case of uh, congenital cerebroblastic anemia with uh, B cell immune deficiency. It's super rare. And I think there are only 60 published cases in the literature. So that's something very rare, extreme rare entity. So it's publishable. So we published this case and it was easy. So let's say that you, with the help of someone on the clinic, like your senior colleague or the uh, consultant, you've come across a very publishable, nice case. So what should you do next? So before moving to the next step, I just wanna see if you guys have any questions about the recognition step. Okay, perfect, I don't see any questions. So let's go over search. I know, um, Search can be difficult and there are multiple ways of doing the search. I usually do a, a whole workshop on how to conduct a proper search on PubMed and other um, uh, midline um, searches for systematic review and how to really do a well-organized systematic review search. But for the sake of the case report, the search is going to be very narrative stage. So it doesn't have any, when we say, systematic review versus narrative review. So narrative review is you don't have a strategy to look for something, but in systematic review, you have a strategy. For example, you will have a timeline. So you have dates to start and date to end, and then you will have keywords and you have criteria to include and exclude. However, for case report, it's not the case because you want something quick and you just want to take a look at the literature, see what's there. And do you see a lot of cases or you don't see a lot of cases and you want to publish this case? I usually recommend doing a course or use the help of librarian. So usually, even though I'm, I think I'm good at doing the conducting the um, the search for the systematic review, but I always seek some help from the librarian just to make sure that I'm actually doing a proper uh, systematic review. But for the sake of the case report, it's going to be just a narrative literature review, and I'm gonna go over quickly how to do that through PubMed search. So you go to PubMed website. And then you look for the MeSH database. 
what does that mean? What is mesh database? So mesh database basically gives you all the alternatives for certain words. So when you go to, to the mesh database and you write eczema, again, we're giving more examples of dermatology. So eczema, also known as atopic dermatitis, eczematous dermatitis, or um, atop, atopic dermatitis, eczematous dermatitis with the D and also dermatitis. So if you take all these alternative terms and put them in a very advanced search, so you're gonna, after finding the, uh, putting the word that you, wore, you want, you're gonna click, for example, on eczema, and then you will see all the, um, the other alternatives for that term. After that, you're gonna click on advanced. And when you click on advanced, you will see this kind of search. And in, that, in this kind of search, I want you guys to put, for example, atopic dermatitis or eczema or eczematous dermatitis and the other word that you're looking for. In that case, for example, I used an example of vitamin D because maybe patients with atopic dermatitis have a lower vitamin D level. And then you click on search. Just make sure that here it says PubMed because sometimes if it's still in the mesh database mode, it won't show anything. And after that, you will see how many papers you got. In that case, I got like 489 um, papers. There is a two minute quick review on how to conduct PubMed search on this video um, on YouTube link. I recommend just going over it. If you've never done any uh, just PubMed, if you've never dealt with PubMed before, it would be nice just to go over it and see how you can conduct a PubMed search. So you did a PubMed search, so you will end up by three scenarios. The first possible option is that you didn't find any similar cases in the literature and your case is rare and publishable. So you're gonna move to the next step. The next option is you found many similar cases and you don't think it's interesting or publishable. So I don't usually say give up from the beginning, but let's try and find something publishable in the case. Let's compare it with the other published cases. And I'm talking about when you conduct the uh, PubMed search and then going through the titles and the abstracts and you see, oh, there are so many similar cases to mine. I don't think mine is publishable. Okay, take a, mo take a moment and go again over the cases and see where the cases published, all of them, for example, on the face and your cases on the legs, where they're all unilateral and case your cases like more disseminated or bilateral where the cases in the literature mostly in senior patients and your, ca your case is pediatric case, where the cases in the literature, for example, treated with, um, for example, something the first line and your case treated with something different. I always um, tell the student, just try to do um, more work to find something publishable in the case and don't give up from the beginning. And I usually do this honestly work when someone already uh, wrote a case report and sent it to me and it was on something very common and I feel bad that they already had a lot of time and work doing it and the effort that they spent on writing the case. So I try my best with them to work over it and try to find something publishable in that case. But if you could do, do that from the beginning, that would be great. The third option is you found um, um, the case and you think it's publishable. Uh, so it's getting rejected all the time. So if you found a case that you thought it's publishable and you wrote it, however, every time you send it to the journal, it gets rejected, then we have to try to work it out and find um, why they're getting it rejected and then rework it and resubmit it again. And we'll go over that in details in depth. I just wanna make sure if you guys are writing anything. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we choose measure just to get the similar words and then we plug them by ourselves in PubMed search. Yes, you can do that. Uh, this is basic search for um, case report. It's not like advanced search, but there is a way that we you can actually uh, put all the uh, keywords into PubMed search um, faster than the way I showed you. But the way I showed you is something easy because you you only have few words for case report. So you don't have to really learn the advanced way of doing it. And for the sake of case report, and some people never had any experience with research before, and they just wanna start with case report. So I just recommend doing this basic search strategy. And if you're planning to do a systematic review, which is an, a different workshop that we do, we can go in depth into how to do um, conduct a literature search. So uh, if you found a very interesting case, 
um, you have to download the similar cases in the literature for some reason, because you're going to use these cases when you discuss the, uh, when you write the discussion part of the report to compare and contrast these cases. And we will go in details um, when we come to the, uh, to the writing section. So we'll start now with collecting. So we finished with recognizing the case. And after that, we conducted a quick search and we found that, okay, it's fine, it's publishable. And you also um, consulted, for example, the consultant and you asked him and he said, you know what, this is a real good case. So let's start collecting information. So what do you need? So for the patient, for writing a case report, you need to have all their information, basically the history that we take in the clinic and the uh, physical examination. Uh, and you should take photos and I will give you some tips on taking the photos. And then uh, you know that because of taking images, then you need to take an informed consent. I usually tell the students to, to use the informed consent that is available in the hospital, in the clinic. And uh, I will speak about why certain journals like to use their informed consent, but the majority, they, they do not. So just use the hospital informed consent for that reason. And then you have to, um, if the patient, for example, had a biopsy and you could get the pathology report and also some pathology pictures using the microscope. Some microscope have their cameras, so you can just ask the pathology for their help to provide you with the really good quality pictures. And if you have all the um, information, there are a couple of tips I usually give the medical students on clinical photos when they send me their case reports to review or ask me a question about their case reports. Honestly, some of the pictures are really terrible. So uh, for the journals, most of them, they ask for a high quality pictures and that's usually 300 by 300 pixels. Sometimes if they already took pictures and they're not seeing the patients anymore, and honestly, the case is good. So what I do with them is I ask them to go online. There are certain websites, websites that can actually convert the quality of the pictures. But when you convert it to a higher quality, usually it gets smaller. Um, uh, and usually there are certain websites you can test the quality of the picture just to know from the beginning before submitting into the journal, which is something I usually do all the time to make sure that my uh, images are of high quality because when you submit any paper before it goes to review, it goes to a quality check and they check that to make sure everything is um, fit their criteria. Background, again, some students, they send me pictures and the background is horrible. Like uh, there is, it's an emergency setting. There are a lot of things distracting on the background. Uh, so I usually prefer taking a good picture with, you know, a smooth background. If you can just, uh, you, you know, your unique color, there are certain uh, papers like black or blue where you can put it just behind the patient's body when you take pictures. It doesn't have to be super professional pictures, but at least of a, a good quality picture and a good background. Like don't take a picture where there's like people in the background or messy stuff in the background. As I mentioned, most of the journals, they will not require downloading their own informed consent. But for example, when you check the Saudi Journal of Medicine, they have their own informed consent in English and in Arabic. So if he, the patient already filled the consent from the, uh, the hospital, you can just ask the patient to sign the new one and then fill it up. So that would be easier for you. But again, most journals, they do not ask for their own informed consent. But when you do the online submission, they will, um, you have to testify or just confirm that you actually filled an informed consent because of images. Like for example, the JAD case report, which is um, a lot of dermatology residents submit their case reports to cast a JAD case report. So they do not ask for uh, using their own informed consents and they do not ask for a copy. Even if you take one from the hospital, they do not. Basically, when you just up submit the case online, they will, um, you will have an option where you just click that you um, already obtained the informed consent from the patient. Some students, they ask me about the uh, IRB. They tell me, oh, do I need an IRB approval or ethical committee approval before I write a case report? No, you do not need in general. And do I need to consent the patient for publication? And we mentioned, yes, you do need to consent the patient for publication. Um, but if you're using an identifiable images, such as pathology report, for example, because some resident, they want to publish just a, a pathology findings, for example, or a pathology uh, paper, a case report, or, um, you know, just discussion about the pathology, you do not need um, informed consent from the patient to, to take a pictures of their pathology reports. 
So now we're coming to the most important step, which is the uh, writing step. Do you guys have any questions about the previous steps that we discussed from recognition or uh, search or finally collect before we move forward to the next step? That's all clear, Doctor. You can continue. Okay. Perfect. So we'll go over the writing step. So I'll tell you how I usually do it. So for writing steps, you know that every journal has their own uh, author's guidelines that you have to follow. And I mentioned to you when you submit the case report, usually it goes to someone. Uh, most of the time is not in the medical field, a secretary or, some, or someone who does the uh, quality check on the paper, just to make sure that you're following the guidelines. And what does that mean? It means that the journal's guidelines can be that their word counts is, for example, 500. They only want two images, but you submit three images. So the secretary will get back to you and saying, oh, your paper doesn't fit the our quality guidelines. So you need to change these steps and send it back again before she send it to the reviewer. The other thing is basically, um, uh, in the instructions of the uh, or the author's guideline would include like number of uh, references, um, and all these details. So basically what I do is I do it the way that I'm gonna show you right now, because sometimes it's really hard to uh, try to follow the guidelines of one journal and prepare the paper and then the paper gets rejected. So then you need to rework it and submit it to another journal. So what I usually do most of the time is the way that I'm gonna explain it to you today, very basic and very simple. And it's the most acceptable way in most journals. And if a journal rejected it, and I will look up the author's guideline for the other journal, and usually it's minor changes. I will just adjust the changes and then send it back to the journal. The other thing during writing, I usually write the content first and then look up the references. What does that mean? It means that, for example, if I'm writing about keloids, I will write the definition of keloids because I have some uh, like background about it. Or I would write, okay, if I don't have any background about it, I would just write, okay, the first line, it's going to be the definition of keloids. Between brackets, I'm gonna look up the reference for that. The second line is going to be the prevalence or incidence of keloids. So I'm gonna look up the reference for that. Symptoms of keloid, I'm gonna look up the reference for that. Treatment for keloid, I'm gonna look up the reference for that. This is how we usually do it. I usually write first and then look up the references after. But if you know journal for sure, for example, if you work with a consultant and he said, you know what, we're submitting this to the JAD case report, prepare it for the JAD case report, we're not gonna go to any other journal. Or if the consultant, for example, sometimes people who are heavy in research and they publish a lot, they get an invitation from a journal to submit something in their, um, in their issue, for example. So uh, you just follow up the uh, author's guideline for that journal. So most journals, they use this style that we're gonna go over during this presentation. You have to submit your manuscript. So what does the manuscript mean? The manuscript is basically the whole file that you put everything in is called manuscript. You should use Word document. And in terms of the, uh, the font style, you should use Times New Roman, which is the most acceptable font by most journals. And then the size is 11 or 12. Most of the time I usually use, of all of the time I use 12. And then it should be double spaced. What does that mean? We'll see in the next slide. And then continuous numbering, which is something important for the reviewers. Again, don't panic. We're gonna see it in the next slide. And then the page, all pages should be numbered. And finally, running head, which the most, uh, most of the time I get this question from the students, or if I work on a case report with a student, they always email me back, uh, hey, what, what does that mean? What is the running head? So we'll go over that. So we'll start by, um, every element in the um, that we just went over. So the running head, basically, if you double click in the Word document here, you will be able to write something. And what should you write there? The running head, most journals ask for maximum 50 words for the running head. And the running head basically is just a shorter version of the manuscript or your case report. For example, in this study, which is the prevalence of hydronata supertiva, systematic review and meta-analysis regression study that we published in JAMA. So this study, for example, I double clicked here and I wrote the prevalence of hydronata supertiva. I didn't write the whole title here. So what happens is this small 
uh, heading, which is called the running head, will appear every on every page, on the top of every page. And sometimes that for people just to follow up and read, to remember, oh, okay, I'm reading this case report if I'm in page three or page four, so I'm, I'm not losing um, you know, uh, track on the, uh, the paper that I'm reading. So that's basically it. It just a, a very short version of the case report. Some student, they would ask, what if my case report title is so short? Can I use it? Yes, you can. You can just copy paste it. You don't have to make it any shorter. If it is already short to begin with, just keep it as it, as it is. The next one is double spacing. And what the double spacing meaning, so you click here in a Word document and then you click tool. And it means that the space between um, every line and another, uh, for example, the space between every sentence and the next sentence is going to be around two. So it get, just gives a wide space between the two lines and it make it easy to read. And it will give you more pages if you do that. I usually double space everything except the references. Although I see some students, they usually double space the references, which is fine. But I just feel like it's too much uh, double spacing the references. I will end up by having like 14 pages instead of having five pages. The second thing is the continuous numbering. So you're gonna click on layout and then uh, line numbers and you're gonna click on continuous numbering. What does that mean? It means that on the left side of the page, you will see these numbers that goes from one to the end of your manuscript. Why is this important? This will not appear on the published um, version of your manuscript. It's just important for the reviewers. For example, uh, because I review a couple of papers, so when I review, I usually uh, send a Word document with my uh, comments to the authors who send their manuscript to the journal saying, please go to page number five, line number 56, uh, and you have an English error there or a typo that you need to correct. Please add a reference in page 10, line number 120. So basically the continuous numbering, it just numbers on the left side of the page and it's just important for the reviewers if they wanna to refer to a certain sentences when they do the review process. Insert, the page number is easy. You just click on insert and page number here. It will appear, it depends on the journals. Most journals, they usually ask for the right lower corner, but some journals, they just ask for the right upper corner. I think this was the uh, JAT case report that they like it to be on the right upper corner, but most other journals, they usually ask it on the right lower corner. These minor details, you see them in the author's guidelines. It's not a big deal. You just do it from the beginning. Make sure that you're, uh, manuscript follows all the uh, their author's guideline before, you know, I, I feel bad if it gets rejected for quality uh, issue from the beginning. And then we move to the, the first page of your manuscript is called the title page. Some journals, they ask you to submit the title page separately, which is fine, but most journals, they ask you to submit the title page within the manuscript. So it is the first page of the manuscript. So when we say, uh, some students, they ask me, what is title page? So title page is the first page that has the title of the case report and what should, should it have? So this is very, very important. So what should we put in the first title page? Number one is the running head that we discussed and we know it's a shorter version of the title. We're gonna put it here. Uh, if the title is already short, we're, we're just gonna copy and paste it. And then the title number and order of the authors. Again, I get a lot of questions about uh, some students they, who've never done any research before and they're doing their first case report. They confuse what is the number on the upper, um, on the upper um, corner of each uh, author. What does that represent? Does number one means I am the first author and number two means I'm the second author? It doesn't mean that. Number one, just refer to your institution. For example, if you're a student at um, King Saud and Abdulaziz University in Riyadh. So basically, and the division of, for example, a medical school. So you're going to write like medical school, King Saud and Abdulaziz University, Riyadh, and you're going to put the address, Saudi Arabia. And you're going to put, put number one. If you're all from the same institution, so all of you are going to be from number one. In this case report, for example, or in this study, it was, uh, I think this was a case series. In this case series, for example, um, I'm from McGill and the staff that I worked with, she's also from McGill. So both of us got number one. And Dr. Alavi, she is from um, 
she's not she know she now works at the Mayo Clinic, but she was from Toronto. And then Dr. Goldberg, she's from US. So basically, this is how we did it. So everyone has a number, and then the number referred to their institution. And then the corresponding author. Again, what do, what does corresponding author mean? It means that when your paper is published in the literature, and let's say, for example, this paper was uh, patients who have a disease called hydrogen supportive and they suffer from keloids. And in this paper, we uh, provided them with some surgical tips on how to treat these keloids. And Dr. Goldberg, Goldberg, she's a surgeon. So she wanted to be the corresponding author for this paper. So basically she is a corresponding author. So let's say for example, uh, I saw this published in the literature and I have a patient with keloid, but she didn't mention in her, for example, uh, case report, the dose that she used, or there was like a question about the technique that I didn't understand. I, and I have a question about the case. So I would just email her and say, you know what? Hi, Dr. Goldberg. Uh, I read your uh, case report that was published in JAD with great interest. I have a question for you. Do you remember the dose that you used for your patients? So this is how it is. Or if another journal want to email the corresponding author, so basically they will find the email of the corresponding author. If, for example, the paper um, is in the final process of publications, or if the, uh, the journal has some comments and the reviewers, all the communications will be through the corresponding author. So the corresp corresponding author is the person that the journal will communicate with and people in the future will communicate with. If that's clear, I think that's clear. And then basically in the title page, you should also put the uh, the text numbers, like how many words count do you have, the figures, tables, references. Uh, maybe not in this paper, but I recently like to put, for example, a dash and then basically put what is after it. For example, if the, um, I think we'll have examples of that one. If the paper is asking for, um, for example, maximum 500 words, just showing them that I'm following their guidelines, I would say my word count is 400 out of 500, for example. If they're asking for maximum two figures, I would say like I have two figures out of two figures, just to show the journal from the beginning that you're actually aware of their guidelines and you're following up. Same thing for the references, it's like 16 out of 20. For case report, because this is a case series, so we're fine with 16 references, but in general, in case report, the maximum number of references is up to six. However, again, you check with the journals, some journals like the Saudi Journal of Dermatology, I think they, they can take up to 10 references. So it varies from one journal to another. I just feel that for case reports, it's enough to keep it limited to six references, honestly, unless it's something really um, needed to be explored. And then funding and declaration of conflict of interest. Most of the time for case reports, we don't have funding. So we just declare that we don't have funding. And then for conflict of interest, if for example, um, for Hydronacha Supertiva, um, you know, if you write a line about, for example, Himera, which is Adilumumab, and for example, um, Dr. Alavi and Dr. O'Brien, they work for AV company, which produced this medication, you have to declare this conflict of interest although it has nothing to do with the case report, but then it has something to do with the disease. So maybe she would write a line that patients who receive um, adilumumab or Humira gets less keloid, so she is promoting for the medication. Uh, it's just important to declare this uh, conflict of interest. So we come to the um, second page, which is basically after the first page, which we call the title, and we went over everything in the title, then basically we're going to go over the, the second page. Some journals, they ask for abstract for case reports. I honestly don't feel it's necessary, and most journals, they don't. But if they ask for an abstract, the abstract should be structured. I reviewed the case report like three days ago from my friend who, um, who's a rheumatology resident actually in France, and no, sorry, this was, was actually from Riyadh, the case report that I reviewed. And she actually wrote an abstract that was structured. Like she wrote um, background, methods, results, discussion, conclusion. And for me, that was like surprising because for case reports, you're not to put a structured abstract with headlines. The, the, the abstract for case report should be a very brief summary of the whole case. 
I usually tell the medical students, remember how you present early in morning uh, during rounds after, or it's basically presenting not during rounds, but early in morning when you present to the new team uh, after finishing your own call shift and you give them like two or three liners on the case. So this is how you should do it. It basically should be a very brief, clean summary about the case. Um, so it should be unstructured and not structured. And then we go to introduction, which we will go over case presentation, discussion, conclusion, and then acknowledgement, if you wanna thank someone and optional. Most of the time for case reports, I don't honestly put acknowledgement, I usually put it for others. I listen my case reports, there was a pathologist who helped me and he's fine of, by not being, for example, an author, because the journal has like four uh, limits of authors and uh, me and my other colleagues, like the resident of the medical students and this, the consultant, we wanna be authors. So we don't have room for an extra author. So I may put that in the acknowledgement if the pathologists agree on that. But most of the time I do not put the acknowledgement for case reports and finally references. So before going in depth on each one of them, do you guys have any questions so far? I just wanna make sure that I'm not sleeping while I'm talking because I just literally woke up. Everything seems to be clear. Actually, there's one question. Uh, does the primary investigator of the case report have to be a consultant who saw the case or is it fine to talk to any senior in the institution? Uh, so basically, uh, technically, uh, if the... Um, the principal, inf not principal investigator ward we don't usually use in case report. We use in other different study designs. For case report, we don't typically use the principal investigator. The, the corresponding author, typically a senior author, and typically all of the time, if not most of the time, it's the staff who works in the clinic. So let's say I'm working in a clinic uh, and the clinic is under Dr. Hausawi, uh, for example. So if I see a case, uh, and I was a medical student and I've seen a case where, for example, Dr. Gada, who was a resident, and she, for example, thought, oh, uh, Hadi, oh this is a very interesting case. You're interested in Derm, you want to write it up? And I was like, okay, yeah, let's do it. Let's write it up. So I would write it up. I saw the case with her. She discussed maybe the case verbally with Dr. Hausawi. So I imagine in that case, the corresponding author would be Dr. Hausawi. Does it have to be a consultant? No, it doesn't have to be a consultant. Senior... It depends, I'm just ask, I'm just saying like, if, for example, the uh, senior registrar is the one who's running the clinic and you saw the case with him or with her, it's fine. Like the title doesn't have to be a consultant. Is that clear? Yes, it's clear, shukran doctor. Okay, perfect. By then one last question, uh, Sarah asked, and what if she has 12 references, would she have to reduce them or does that depend on uh, journal specifications? Uh, this is honestly an excellent question, Sarah. It happened with me a couple of times, where uh, especially for JAT, because I usually write letters for JAT, and the letters is they ask for four references. So four references is a huge challenge to me, and sometimes I'm like, oh, I want to add this reference. Like really, I want to add this reference. Like I can't. It's like there is no way. So I would put five references, and they would take it. So I would say if they ask for ten and you put eleven, it's okay. But if they ask for 10 and you put 15, no, that's not okay. You know what I'm saying? Like one, maybe two, like stretching it, fine. I would say one is most of the time fine. And when I review uh, case reports and I will review other study designs as a reviewer, if I see an extra reference, I usually don't say anything about it. But if I see like the authors that put like too much references, I usually say, no, you have to really shorten your references. It's too much. Um, I hope that make it clear. Yes, it's clear. We can go on. Should okay, perfect. So now we're going to go over the step of writing the case report. And as we mentioned, it's sections. So the se first section is typically the introduction. So you're going to int introduce your case report. And it's typically two to four paragraphs. I'm going to go over it very slowly. And I'm going to show you guys how to write it up. It's so easy. And then the last few lines of each uh, of the introduction sections should be an introductory to your case report. Like uh, here we present a case of this and that. We'll go over a lot of examples until we understand it clearly. 
my tip for the introduction is focus on what is related to your case report. For example, if your case report reporting an excellent response to treatment, to, um, for example, psoriasis, I'm going to make the first few lines, psoriasis is a chronic inflammatory disease with a global prevalence of 2%, usually typically affects arms, elbows. The pathogenesis of uh, psoriasis is multifactorial. The treatment of psoriasis is, then I'm going to talk a lot about the treatment because my case report is reporting the treatment, excellent response to the treatment. Let's say my case report is reporting uh, a pathogenesis so I'm gonna talk in my introduction a lot on pathogenesis because I'm reporting something related to the pathogenesis. We'll go over examples. I think with examples, it will, it will be clear. So this, for example, case report uh, was a family that I saw with uh, hydronatus supportiva. And then I was surprised, like why all family members have hydronatus supportiva? There must be a genetic component of it. So basically we did a genetic testing on a couple of genes that they're being reported in China to cause an like Asian population that can cause actually um, hydrogen supertiva. So, but the variant in the same genes was not the same variant that everyone reported before. So we reported novel variants. See how I'm trying to make my case report interesting. If I reported the same gene uh, in the same family, okay, reported before China. So not, not, it didn't bring anything new to the literature, but if what I'm trying to bring new and make it interesting, and I'm trying to sell my case report is I'm bringing, I'm bringing a novel variance of these genes because when I compared the variants, they were completely different. So look here at the introduction. We wanna go over how to write an introduction for your case report. First, what do I have in my title? What is my case is about? My case is about hydronatus supportiva. Cool, so basically I'm gonna talk a little bit about hydronatus supportiva, it's an inflammatory disease. It affects uh, like body folds. It has a prevalence of this and that. And then some association with hydrodontis sportiva, pathogenesis. And then look at the second paragraph. Did I talk about association of hydrodontis sportiva? Let's say, for example, I'm reporting a case of a patient with Crohn's disease uh, who has hydrodontis sportiva, which was back in the days was something reportable before we know that actually patients with IBD have a strong association with IBD from a systematic review and meta-analysis. So did I explore it more here and talk more about the association of hydrogenase supportiva and then introduce Crohn's disease? No, because my case is about genetic. So basically what I did in the second paragraph, I talked a lot about genetics and gene for hydrogenase supportiva because my case report is about genetic. Let's take another example. I'm talking about keloids and I'm talking about um, hydronatus sportiva case. So what I've been doing is basically I will uh, break down my title. So my title is hydronatus sportiva and keloids. I started by talking, by defining uh, keloids and what is keloids and how it present. And then basically I talked about hydronatus sportiva. See the first paragraph is about keloids and the second paragraph is about hydronatus sportiva. And then, or did I talk about genetics and hydronatus supportiva? No, I talked how patients with hydronatus supportiva would heal, the healing process in hydronatus supportiva, because I want to introduce the, uh, the readers to the keloids concept. Like lesions can heal with the trophic scars, with hypertrophic scars, with the uh, cripiform scars, they can actually have keloids in patients of African ethnicity. And then, uh, talking about the challenges that we face in treating keloids in these patients that have a cons constant chronic inflammatory process. Is that clear? I just wanna make sure you guys understand every uh, part of the, uh, the writing process. So we, I don't wanna move to a part and you have question or the previous part is not clear. It may be overwhelming if you have never wrote a case report before, but that's fine. I think it's recorded and will be available. If you write your case report and watching this, Hopefully you will um, remember things and go over things that are missing. Okay, perfect. So we'll go over the case presentation. And I told you I merged the case report with the case series because they're pretty much similar in everything except in the case presentation. There are some technical differences that I will go over. So for the case presentation, basically you're gonna speak about the patient's demographics. So what does that mean? It means the patient's sex, ethnicity, age, 
and then their past medical history, surgical, if relevant to the case. And then if you do perform the biopsy, if you had some imaging, so you would put them. And then pertinent negatives. For example, if with the case of um, Stephen Johnson, if I read the case and I don't see Nikoliski sign, I will be really surprised. So you really have to mention something very important and pertinent positive in that case, which is positive Nikoliski sign. And for those who are attending with from the non-derm field, Nikoliski sign is just basically performing a pressure on the skin and feeling that the skin is sloughing off. And this is something we see in the entity of Stephen Johnson TN spectrum. If you don't see that, it's unlikely to be Stephen Johnson TN. So that's a very important pertinent positive. And these pertinent negatives are also important to rule out differential diagnosis. So if I'm reading your case and I was like, hmm, why, why he's reporting the case of keloids? It usually comes with trauma. So for me in the keloid case that was presented in the girl where it was disseminated and spontaneous without history of trauma, I have to mention in my uh, history, patient denied any history of trauma, patient denied any history of uh, keloid formation after surgery, for example. So you're actually putting pertinent negatives here. Uh, chronological order, so make it um, in order and we'll go over an example to see what does that mean. And then it should be written in terms of English in the past tense and I'm go over a couple of tips at the end on how to actually clean the papers from all the English mistakes and make sure that it reads very well. And then something very common, I've, I don't know why, but most of the case reports that I get from Saudi Arabia to review from med students or residents, they put the hospital name. I don't know if that's a concept and they put the exact date. Like they put, I've seen this patient in uh, May 5th, um, 2021 at the King Faisal Specialist Hospital. If I am reading your case, uh, like one year from now, what is the advantage of knowing that this case being presented at that year? It, it may be important for me that this patient being suffering from this disease for one year. So you just have to write like patient had this for one year or a couple of months. And then what is the importance of putting the institution? What does it, what does it add to the paper? But putting the setting, the clinical setting is important. For example, if you're putting emergency department versus clinic, that could be relevant if it is relevant to the case, but not putting the name of the institution. I don't think that's relevant. The other thing I've seen a lot in the, uh, a mistake that I've seen in the uh, case reports that I see from the uh, Saudi students is they put a patient, a Saudi patient. So Saudi patient could be of Asian ethnicity, could be of African ethnicity and could be of you know Middle Eastern or Arab ethnicity. It is important to put the ethnicity if it is relevant to the case, but the nationality is not. In this case, I intentionally showed you this example of patient with Han Chinese because patient with Han Chinese have a genetic predisposition to develop uh, Stephen Johnson and TN if they've been exposed to certain medications Typically, um, carpamazepine is one of the example of them, but there are other examples such as albuterol. So, in that case, it would be relevant to the case, and it would make sense. Hmm, okay, that makes sense. She's Han Chinese, and she's exposed to carpamazepine. Why they didn't do a genetic testing before they put the patient on this medication, which is a recommendation that a lot of people are advocating for. So putting the nationality is not important. And then putting the ethnicity. Again, if you're publishing someone from Saudi Arabia, make sure you put a patient of F relevant, uh, of Arab origin, of Middle Eastern origin. And again, I've reviewed a case a couple of days ago. Um, I think the patient was having IBD and developed PG and then complicated with something else. So it was a, a nice case. But the, in the, the case presentation, uh, she wrote Caucasian ethnicity. I was like, okay, Caucasian ethnicity. And then I verified with her and she said, oh no, I thought because the patient was having white skin, um, he's of Caucasian ethnicity. Again, no, because we're Arab, we're Middle Eastern, we're not Caucasian. And Caucasian is the different ethnicity, it's white ethnicity. So just make sure that it's clear before you send the case to the, uh, to the journal. And again, Please do not mention the name of the institution, but mention the setting. For example, 
it's really relevant in this case to know that this patient was Stephen Johnson, which is an emergency, that she went to the emergency department. She didn't go to the dermatology clinic, for example. And then talking about the chronological order, so you can see in this case that we started with her age, uh, ethnicity, if this is relevant, the sitting, and then we talked a little a bit about the, um, the signs. And usually I do not include the signs unless it's relevant. Again, it's relevant for this case because it's in one of our score 10 um, uh, scoring system that we do to predict the prognosis of the patient. And then uh, after that, we went to the biopsy and what did we see on the biopsy? And then we spoke about the treatment. So this is how it should be, like how the patient presented, it's been going on for how long, and then talk about what did you do next in terms of examination. The same chronological order that you use in the clinic when you present a case or write, for example, a progress note or a consult that you start by history and then physical examination and then your investigation, which basically most of the time in dermatology include biopsy and finally the treatment. Uh, this is also another example of a patient with um, Haley Haley disease. So in this case, I also wanted to point out that we wrote, for example, 30 years ago. I didn't write, for example, 1986. I didn't write 1989. I wrote 30 years ago, which means that this patient been suffering from this medication for a while. And then here I specified that the patient presented to the genoderm, which is fine, but you could actually just say that the patient presented to dermatology clinic. So again, did I write the name of the institution here? No. So this is how it should be. And then again, we go about his history, what treatment he tried in the past, and then again, chronological order, what did I do in terms of physical examination? And then as we know that this disease is diagnosed by genetic testing, so we perform typically the genetic testing and this is our finding. So this is how we confirm the case. Um, it's important to put the pertinent negative, as I mentioned, like if there is something that uh, when I read this case, I was like, hmm, why is not an infection? Why is not this? So patient denied, patient doesn't have, so you have to put the pertinent negative. Sometimes when you send the case report to the journal, they wanted you to write it as a letter. I, I know that we don't have a specific tone letters, but I want you to know that what is letter means and what is research letter. Very, very, very brief summary. It's around like maximum 500 words. It's very brief summary and it doesn't have structures. What does that mean? It doesn't have introduction, case presentation, uh, discussion and conclusion. It's just only one paragraph. You're gonna put like research letter, uh, hyaluronic subjective as a chronic inflammation. We present a case with hyaluronic subjective who suffered from keloid. We treated this patient with this. Our conclusion, authors should consider this. Other studies need this to explore this more done for references sent for publication, it gets published and it's a research letter. And, you know, it's a publication, it's a good publication and um, it's very easy to do and it's very, very quick and short. So I will go over a couple of examples. For example, the microcystic adenine cell carcinoma, I sent it to the European Journal of Dermatology and they said they wanted to, because that journal is a strong journal and they don't have a room for a case report, but they thought our case was interesting. And then they're recommending changing the case into a, a research letter. So this is a research letter, for example. You can see that basically you can write to the editor or research editor. I think I will show you another version on something as well I published as a research letter. And then basically you just write down everything. There is no headlines and you put the references. It's so easy and basically the way you write it, you should put it in your head like, okay, I'm gonna start with the introduction, I'm gonna present the case, I'm gonna discuss a little bit, and I'm gonna thin, I'm gonna put the conclusion. It, you're gonna follow the same style that you follow for the uh, case reports writing, but in a very summarized way and without headlines. You don't have to put like introduction as like the word introduction, but basically your first paragraph is expected to be an introduction. Again, this is a clinical research a letter or a research letter. And this is, again, this is a couple of research letter I wrote on the, um, because I started doing some, um, some, uh, some like work on the uh, cutaneous imaging, particularly the cutaneous ultrasound. And we've been publishing findings how to recognize certain entities. So this one of them was like enc just encapsulated fat necrosis and how to identify it using the cutaneous ultrasound. 
so th this was a research letter so it's so easy and it didn't honestly take me two days to write so it's very quick publication uh, and basically uh, we wrote it just like you know without any headlines just going through everything and then this is also another trick I start doing for the journal some journals they say I just want you to submit one figure and I was like one figure it's really challenging because I need to you know I have a clinical picture or I have a radiological imaging and then I have a pathology imaging so it's hard for me just to use one picture so I start splitting them to A and B but be careful because some journal uh, start you know knowing this trick and they write in their author's guidelines A would count as a separate figure and B would count as a separate figure so it would count as two figures with some journals but some still actually uh, accept this um, trick of like splitting the image into A and B, which I do in some journals when they ask for one image, it's difficult. So now in the case presentation, I want to just uh, point out the differences between writing case report and case series. So for case series, basically you're going to do the introduction exactly the same like the case report. The only difference is in the case presentation. The case series, for example, if you have three cases with the similar um, disease, or if you have, you've seen a couple of cases and the staff, for example, told you, like right now I'm writing a case series on a medication that causes um, uh, cutaneous side effects. The medication is given for other entities, but we've started seeing the patients who develop the side effects and they have 20 cases. So it's something nice and something, um, maybe one or two case reports in the literature. So I said, you know what, why not just to put all the cases that we have, which is a good number, 20, to put them in a case series, which we are, what we are doing right now. So for the case series, it's hard in the case presentation section to go over it and write patient number one presented with this and that, patient number two presented with this and that, and put all this, their story. It will take forever to write, and also will take a lot of word count, and again, it will take a lot of space in your case report. That is usually limited or case series. So what I typically do in all case series, I usually um, make a table with all the cases. And then basically in the table, I would write the number of the case, their age, like their demographics, age, sex, ethnicity, if relevant. And then what I'm publishing on, am I, am I publishing on a uh, keloid? So I'm just gonna write keloid location. If you're publishing on, for example, um, a disease, you're gonna write maybe the disease location, the symptom of the disease, if they present with the symptom, um, it depends what is in your case and then basically you're going to choose things from your cases and put them in separate columns and start fill all these columns so that will be very clean and nice and easy summary to the readers and this is what I've done here like for example for hydronized supertiva we have a severity scoring system called Haley staging system so for that I just put all the stages so it will the reader will read this and it's like okay this patient is maybe moderate this is mild this is severe what is their keloids, what kind of treatment they use for their cases. So it depends on the case that you're publishing or the case series that you're doing. But my advice for the case presentation and case series section, always make a table to summarize all the cases. Is that clear? Do we have questions on this? Yes, Victor, first of all, Sarah to sell, uh, is it possible to publish a case report then make a case series out of it? Uh, if the case report that you published um, and you're going to use the same case report in the case series, this is not doable. And actually, it's unethical to do that. However, if you um, publish the case, for example, uh, of a patient with something and you have this published case and it's already in the literature, what you can do is basically you can cite this case in your uh, in your, for example, case series. So what I would do, if you look at this table, I would do the same thing and I would still put the case, but I will put here the reference for that case. So people, when they read the table, they will say, oh, there is a reference next to that case. So it's already published. And it's also good for you because if you publish that case and you cite your case, uh, we'll talk um, maybe later about this one is the citation and the benefit of increasing the impact factor of the journal and the benefit um, of citation for you as a, an, as a researcher as well. So I would do it the same. And I think I've done that before. I'm pretty sure I've done it before. 
I put up a case that was already published in the literature and I put my um, case, but the case that was published wasn't mine. So it was someone else, else published case. So I made a table and I compared uh, my case that was published with the, my cases in the case series with the other cases that they were published and I put the references. But in, in your case, if you're the one who published that case, you can use it. It's completely fine, but you have to indicate that it was published and put the reference, but you can just reuse it again without um, saying that it was published. That wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't look good. Okay, we also have uh, another question. If you could please talk about the literature review for case reports. Do we have to include all relevant papers and how many as a minimum do we have to review? You don't have to include all the relevant cases. So, uh, so if, for example, I have uh, so many cases, I would see how many cases I have. If I have, for example, uh, five, six, seven cases um, with similar to mine, um, I will just put them in the discussion saying, for example, um, my case, we treated my case with this, then there is a published case that would treat it with that and then put the reference for that case. Or what you can do is you can do a table and put all the cases that you found in the literature and then put your case to compare and contrast the cases. And this is actually bringing us to the discussion section. It's where I use the, uh, the, uh, the, the papers that I found in my initial search. I don't use all of them. And again, it's, this is going back to the point of saying narrative search. And that's why some journals, they don't like the narrative literature review, which is something I also see students do, like they just do literature review, it's not systematic review, so it's not, doesn't have a strategy. That has a bias and the bias is basically you selecting certain cases and not selecting the other cases and ignoring the other cases. But if you go with the systematic review, you're gonna tell me why did you select that and why did you um, exclude that case? You know what I'm saying? I've done a systematic review on cases in patients with squamous cell carcinoma and hydronized subretiva, you will see it published. And I think there were around 100 cases. So there were a lot of cases to do. But in that case, it was a systematic review. So I said, for example, I included this case because of this and I excluded this case because of that. But if it was a narrative review, I would just choose based on my reading, based on maybe my preference. So that's a bit biased. It's not you know, systematic. How many, I mean, it depends on your case. If your case discussing treatment, you're not gonna include all the cases. You can gonna include maybe a few cases of the same treatment. You don't have to include all of them. I typically, what I do, another trick, is if I, uh, for example, I'm sending my case to JAD case reports and uh, I'm looking at keloids and hydronized supertiva or I'm looking at, for example, uh, I don't know, uh, naltrexone and Haley Haley. And I saw that there was a case that was published in JAD case reports and another like two other cases were published in the Saudi Journal of Dermatology, the European Journal of Dermatology, the British Journal of Dermatology. Which one of them would, would, would you choose? I typically choose the JAD one. Why? Because I'm submitting it to JAD. And we'll go back to that. We'll go back to this point is basically that publishing something with, a, with citing the journal that will increase the, um, the impact factor of the journal. Although in some way this is called like auto citation and may not count, but sometimes it counts. So it's good that you're referencing something that was published in the same journal. And also I do that with JAMA when I send my paper to JAMA, basically in my cover letter that we will discuss, I put, I'm sending you this case based on, for example, or I'm sending you this study based on the study that was published in your journal about this and that, and it's actually revealed this and that. Is that clear? Yes, it's clear, Doctor. So for the discussion part, it's basically comparing and contrasting your case with the other cases that are published in the literature. And for example, um, you would say, for example, uh, the cases that were published in the literature were on the, because you're not gonna put that in the introduction, are you going to put that in the, the, um, the case presentation that your case, for example, presented with a lesion on the thigh, but you're not going to say cases in the literature 
the case of macrocystic and inic cell carcinoma, it's all the time present on the sun exposed area, on the face, hands, but your case on the sun protected area, on the thigh. So in the discussion, if you read the letter, you will see that I, I wrote a lot of patients in the literature or these cases in the literature and reference these cases present with microcystic and cell carcinoma on the face or on the hand. And then my case presents on the thigh. Another check I also do, if there is already a review in the literature about the cases in the literature that were published, you can use it as a one reference and you can talk about the cases. That's another trick you can do. For example, if there is someone who actually did the literature review on all the cases of uh, acne and you're publishing on acne, instead of going over thousand cases of acne, you can just take that review of that cases and talk about the cases inside the review. It's completely fine to do so. Is that clear? And then basically I put things like the, try just to sell your case. For example, I put all the, the cases in the literature of microcystic adeno, uh, microcystic and exocarcinoma carcinoma, where for example, painless most of the time or painful because they usually involve nerve. So mine is painless. So, you know, this is another thing. I'm just trying to compare and contrast what is different in my case would make it unique to get published in your journal and people need to know about it compared to the other cases. So basically, if someone sees a patient with a lesion that is on the sun protected area that looks like mine and painless, doesn't look typically like microcystic and cell carcinoma, should consider microcystic and cell carcinoma in their differential diagnosis. That's the message that we are trying to deliver from this case. The last of uh, paragraph or the section of the case report is typically the conclusion. So the conclusion, the first line of the conclusion is going to be like you're summarizing the case, like just a summary of the case. And then you have to give a meaningful message and recommendation to the leaders. What did we learn from reading your case report? So we learned that naltrexone with magnesium supplementation can be used and can be beneficial in patients who are suffering from Haley Haley disease if they're refractory to other uh, treatment elements. Okay, so usually the way I usually format this or phrase it is physicians should be aware of, for example, if the MAC case that was in a prison, that was in a location that was unusual location. So I would say dermatologists or physicians should be aware of this unusual presentation of this disease or physicians should be aware of the side effect of this disease or should be aware of this association to screen patients. For example, back in the days, patients started reporting that uh, patients with hydronarch superativa would have as well um, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So basically I would write in my case report, if that was the first case report of IBD and NHS, I would write uh, patients, uh, dermatologists seeing patients with hydronarch superativa should screen them clinically by asking them about diarrhea and GI symptoms and should refer them to gastroenterology for scoping or doing fecal calprotectin when indicated. So this is a very nice uh, message that you're pro providing to the readers. And then basically, I always list opportunity for further research. For example, the case of the naltrexone and the magnesium. Yes, it's a case report, but again, there, there could be a bias. It's not well controlled. It's not a randomized controlled trials. And this is going back to the pyramid of evidence that I told you. Sometimes it's really impossible to do the randomized controlled trials and the meta-analysis from the beginning if you don't have a base to start with, if you don't know that this medication actually has a potential to work, to invest all that time and effort in doing randomized controlled trial. So typically I would write something such as larger studies as are, um, such as randomized controlled trials are needed to test this, the efficacy of this medication. And then we're gonna talk about the references. Yesterday, I think when I was going to work, I had the chance to listen to the uh, first talk uh, that was presented by Dr. Gaza, which was a wonderful talk about mentally. And honestly, it wasn't on my presentation, but I added it after listening to her talk. I think I would really re-listen to it if it is recorded and just go step by step with her on how to actually perform uh, referencing using Mendeley. Again, four case reports, you do not need to go over this and you do not to go um, to really, um, you know, learn it that much if you don't have time. And if you're just having a limited exposure to dermatology and you wanna publish something fast, 
but definitely if you do want to do any other study design you would really need to learn it i typically used and not but honestly i add mentally after listening to her talk which was very clear and nice and i i like i like it but i'm going to try it probably for my next research again i usually ask the hospital librarian to give me assistant if they usually um, if I'm struggling with searching for my case report or for my study in general, I typically ask their, their help for um, like larger studies such as systematic review. And honestly, I find most institutions, they usually have courses on how to conduct literature search and um, the, the softwares that I usually use for these referencing. Um, so I usually had a couple of courses on how to use EndNote and this is the, 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 um, the software that I use in Canada and also here in Harvard, we use most of the time in Note. So I'm using in Note most of my in most of my publications. I remember using Mendeley a really long time ago when I was mid student. Uh, but I'm happy to um, go over uh, Dr. Gada's uh, presentation again and watch the video and try it for my next presentation for my next paper. Uh, and then again, you have to check with your institution because some institution have subscription to uh, in Note and I. One student told me once I paid this much for a not subscription, you do not have to do this if it is actually covered by your institution. So check which referencing software they are dealing with. And if they have um, an agreement, then basically just use it. And then I also heard yesterday that they spoke about the proper way of putting the reference. And in most journals, they use the Vancouver style. So the Vancouver style should be something like the author name, title, journal, year, volume between bracket the issue and then page to page. If you're writing a case report and you have only four references, it's fine to copy paste them from the PubMed or to type them. It's completely fine because there are just only five references or four references. But if you're doing something um, like, you know, a bigger study like case control or literature review or systematic review or meta-analysis. In that case, you really need to use the, uh, the referencing softwares for that reason. Because sometimes when you change the sentences, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Gada went, uh, went over this, is basically when you change the sentences in your manuscript, actually automatically uh, the references order changes with it. So that's great and it actually saves a lot of effort. The other also good thing that I'm pretty sure she mentioned is you can change the style of the reference. Like let's say, for example, most journals accept Vancouver, but JAMA, for example, accepts JAMA style. So for JAMA, instead of just going over every reference and changing them, you can just do a small click on the, um, a quick click on the, um, this, the referencing style and change it from Vancouver to JAMA. Is there any questions? Yes. Fee Dubuan okay. is asking, if you want to report a case of case syndromes occurring together, what could the message in the concluding paragraph be? Uh, oh, sorry. Is that in the questions or in the uh, comments? It's Do in you want to sing that again? Yeah, sure. Uh, Rudwan wants to report a case uh, of two syndromes occurring together. What could the message in the concluding paragraph be? So I would, in that case, if I see two syndromes occurring at the same time, I would see which one is usually a common syndrome and uh, people know, um, like the, I know syndromes are not very common, both of them, but if one is commoner than the other, I would report that one. And I would, in my conclusion, I would say, um, because when you, for example, have a syndrome in a certain entity, such as the ichthyosis syndromes, when you do a genetic testing, you're not going to test the patient. You're not going to do a whole genome exome testing, which is something that to test the whole gene of the patient for anything. Very expensive and hard to do. You're going to do genetic testing in that case would include doing a genetic panel only for the ichthyosis gene. So we're going to look for certain genes. Is that what people do most of the time? Yes. So what you should do is basically you should say that physician or dermatologist when they see the syndrome, they should be aware of the association of the syndrome through screening the patients clinically for the findings of the syndrome and also through ordering genetic testing specific for the syndrome. If that gene is from a diff complete different panel and wasn't ordered with the first gene testing, that's very important because this is how they can miss it. 
And the other thing I would also um, point out is if the other syndrome um, has, for example, a very uh, important association, and by saying that it doesn't have, for example, uh, a risk of cancers, malignancy. So I would say like uh, physicians needs to be aware of the association with this syndrome and why, because this syndrome is actually as dangerous and associated with the uh, the cancer and they should screen the patient for this cancer at this age and then I will provide recommendation for that. Does that make sense? Yes, واضح, Doctor. Shukran. Well, this is how I would sell it. Basically, I would find something interesting in one of the syndromes. I would pick the one that is maybe rare than the other. Make sure that they both have like maybe different genetic testing and I would give recommendation based on that. If there is different genetic testing, I would recommend that by saying a physician should screen and include this genetic panel. If there is uh, features, I would say should, they should look for these features to pick up the syndrome. If there is a cancer, they should know about this association because the malignancy in that syndrome, you know, just try to find something uh, relevant in one of the syndromes and try to sell that thing. Is there any other questions? It's clear, thanks. Okay, perfect. So- uh, we'll... No, everything else. I think I'm seeing questions in the Q&A. So uh, the literature review, I will show you the other talks that I have at the end of the presentation. And if you guys wanna discuss one of them, I'm really happy to do it. And then, yeah, it's basically on how to do a systematic review. So uh, again, I uh, uh, just told you, if you wanna use, uh, uh, Dr. Gada's software, uh, Mendeley, use it. If you want to use EndNote, you can use it. And again, I'm not going to go over this. And I think she did a great job on discussing the referencing yesterday. So, okay. Now let's see if you guys are with me and you're not sleeping. <laughs> you remember what I just mentioned. So if you guys could write in the chat, the um, every number corresponds to what? So for example, what is this sentence that we place on the top of the page? by double clicking here and it will appear on every page and it's usually the shorter version of the title. So what would that be? And I will keep my eyes on the shot. Okay, perfect. Running title or running head, perfect. Good job, guys. Uh, what about number three, which is on the, this number on the upper corner of the page um, and then basically also can be on the lower corner of the page. Okay, page number, excellent. And what about these numbers on the sides of the page that is typically used by reviewers to point out something in your paper and to ask you to change something? Yes, exactly, continuous number, good job. And what about number four, which is this one, the bolded, big, excellent. Number five, which is authors. And my last question is to you guys, what, uh, what is the number above each uh, author uh, represents? Excellent affiliations. Good job, guys. And what about the corresponding author? Uh, is the corresponding author means that he is the first author? What does it entitle? Exactly, who to contact, amazing. You guys are great, perfect. Um, and then after the, 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 the second question is basically what should be, what should come after the title page? I'm gonna look at the chat and see. Excellent introduction, perfect. Or abstract, if they ask for abstract, good job. So again, uh, Coming back to the questions that a lot of students ask, should I need an abstract for the case report? Most of the time, no, but if you need, it should be summary and instructional. And I think I put three stars because I saw a case, I'm pretty sure a few days ago, but just for confidentiality, I'm, I'm not gonna share the case, but it was structured for case report, which is not, shouldn't be the case. And uh, for example, just to show you that uh, this journal, which is the um, Journal of Cutaneous, uh, uh, like the Dermatology Journal in Canada is called GCMS, and it's the open uh, journal for case report, and they ask for an abstract. So their abstract is for the case that I just did. It, it's a summary of the case. Typically what we present in the morning, 
uh, during rounds, when we give like two or three liners on the case that we saw overnight, it's gonna be the same. So some journals, they can ask for a key message. And you remember in the conclusion, I usually include my key messages in the conclusion. Some journals, they ask for just a separate key, key message that they put in the, um, in the beginning of the case report. So this case, this case report, for example, we did put the key message in the beginning, but typically I put it in the conclusion most of the time. But in case you face that, you just have to know that the case, key message means what did I learn from your case? What should I need to um, pay attention to in the future? What should I change in my practice, for example? So it's basically something uh, clinical tips to help the, uh, the readers. Now we come to something called cover letter. When you prepare and you're done with your case report in terms of the manuscript and it's already ready for submission, you have to do one page, maximum two pages. Most of the time I do one page. It's called the cover letter. What does that mean? It means the letter that you will submit with your um, case report to tell the editor in the journal just to summarize your case report and tell the editor that I think my case report is very important to your readers and you're trying to convince the editor to accept your case for publication. Sometimes in JAT case reports, when you do the online submission, there is a section where you can copy paste the cover letter and put it there. And sometimes you can just upload it as a Word document, whatever you like. Most of the times, even if I see the the, the, the section where I just copy paste, I usually upload it as a Word document, but some journals, they don't have the, the option of uploading it. So it's, it's gonna be copy paste the content of whatever you write. Typically I write it this way, this one example of the uh, cover letters, but if you guys need more examples of cover, uh, cover letters for other study designs, you can just email me and I'm happy to send you other versions on how I usually format them. Typically, I'm just, I put the same thing, honestly, copy paste for every case report. I just do minor changes, like what is the title? So I change the titles and I put here, I'm sending this for reviewer as a case report. So if it is like a systematic review or meta-analysis, I usually write as a systematic review or meta-analysis. And then I write the name of the journal. And then I do, I say like in my um, manuscript, I'm submitting a case report of this and that. And usually I try to sell it. So I say, I believe this is suitable for your journal because it discussed this and this. And I believe dermatologists need to be aware about this and this and that. And this usually the last sentence, I leave it always the same, that I certify that me and the other co-authors, we don't have any conflict of interest. We did not consider this. Um, so we didn't submit this paper for publication anywhere else. And we didn't submit it for um, abstract in a conference. And the other thing that I just remembered, some students, they ask me, I have a case that I submitted as an abstract to a conference. Is it possible to publish this case? Yes, it's possible if the case gets accepted before the conference. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's say, for example, you have a, a nice case and you wanna just, you know, put a lot of things in your CV to strengthen your application for dermatology. So you wanna put that you presented it in a conference. You also wanna put that it's published in a journal. So you can actually submit it to a conference, but it should be uh, should appear on the journal first, or it should ac be accepted in the journal first before it gets it appears uh, in the conference. If that's clear, usually it's the editor in chief of the journal. How do I know the editor in chief in the journal? You just put the journal name and write, for example, JAD case report, uh, GCMS case report. Um, for example, the Saudi Journal of Dermatology, which is the Dermatology and Dermatological Surgery, I believe, and then put Editor-in-Chief. See who is that person, and then basically put their name, Dear Dr. Uh, Johnson, Dr. Hosawi, and put their name, and then start putting writing everything. Um, if you go to the journal, you can go to the editorial board, and on the editorial board, they're going to put the, um, the basically who is the editor-in-chief. If you don't see that in Google, but sometimes it always appears if you just type it in Google. Uh, and then basically, you have to sell it, as I mentioned. So you're going to write the importance of having this case report to your readers and certify it wasn't published, there is no conflict of interest, and we all contributed the same. And we approve the submission of this case report as well. And I usually like to include references in my case report, in my cover letter, 
not many people do it, honestly, it's just a personal preference. If, for example, I'm submitting something about, for example, um, a new uh, medicate response to medication, I usually say, well, there was this small study from Europe that showed this medication was working. I tried this on my patient and it worked. And I want to share this finding with our Canadian uh, dermatologist or with American dermatologist. So basically, this is how I usually do it. Uh, but again, a lot of people, they don't put references. I usually put most of the time, not all the time. So after you're done your uh, case report, you need English revision. I know that English is not our mother language. I, of course, I speak Arabic, that's my mother language. And I, of course, I make a lot of mistakes. And it's not about mistakes as well. It's about the way that it should be uh, read. It should read really smoothly. So it's, not, it's nothing illegal. It's basically something very commonly used. And a lot of journals like Elsevier, for example, provides English editing services. Uh, for their non-English, like non-native English speakers, which I use most of the time, honestly. I don't use this website. I do have people that I deal with and I trust. So basically, if you have someone who you trust, just make sure that you don't send it to a website, you know, um, that may break confidentiality of the patients and may get exposed to data that they're not supposed to get exposed to. Uh, just be careful about that, but just send it to someone you trust or send it to someone with like an official website such as Elsevier, for example, and they're going to review it and send it back to you. And sometimes I get a case report from students, and I think recently I got a case report that I was working on review of my friend from like France Dermatology, and I just doing because he is a native French speaker, it was full of English mistakes. So after finishing the introduction, I honestly was, was like really exhausted. I was like, no, that's, that's too many mistakes. So I sent it back to, to him. I didn't complete reviewing it. And I said, you know what? This is the email of someone, just email her, let her review it. She doesn't charge that much. And then basically send it back to me and I'm, I'll review it. But I can't, it's just taking too much to review, to work on the English part. I, and I need to work more on technical parts. Uh, remember that for any writing, basically, we have the ABCD of writing, which is it should be very accurate, brief, and clear at the same time. And then we come to the our fifth and last step, which is submit. So for submitting uh, the paper, most of the time it's online, so through the website. So how do I pick a journal and what would make me pick this journal? So usually the impact factor. And what does the impact factor mean? Is, it means that the papers that appear in that journal, how many times they've been cited. So the more that the papers that are published in that journals are cited, the impact will increase. And the higher impact fa factor, the stronger the journal is. And also sometimes it's difficult to, get, to have your paper accepted in that journal, especially if it is your first publication. Um, I usually say like my first publication was in the best publication. And a lot of my first studies when I was medical student, like, surveys and cross-sectional studies, I look at them right now and I was like, oh my God, this is like terrible. Like, how did I publish this? And how did they actually accept this? So, you know, you improve with time, which is normal thing. It's just the, our natural, you know, uh, thing that we usually improve with time. And there is nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying that sometimes if you go with a very high impact factor journal from the beginning, it may be a bit challenging. And then you wanna look for a journal that is cited in PubMed and Midline. And what does that mean? I think also, uh, you guys discussed this yesterday, is basically that when you, your paper gets published, it will appear on Medline and PubMed. Is that important? Well, sometimes some people, when they do their studies, which is the um, like larger studies, they, they conduct search and they, they, use, they, they use database such as PubMed. So if your paper is not on PubMed, it's not going to include it in their studies. And if it is not included in their studies, it's not going to be cited. And if it's not going to be cited, it's not gonna increase the impact factor of the journal. So that's how it goes in the research world. And then uh, also publication fee. I know that some um, departments, they usually have fund, like my department in Canada used to have like a fund for maker students and residents. And some publications have done like costed, for example, 500 or $800. So I didn't pay it because we have funds, but, I, but if I'm medical students and you know, sometimes it can be challenging but I, although I, I usually advocate for investing in yourself when you're starting your career, 
and then it should be suitable for their case. You're not gonna go to the journal of case reports of radiology and submit a dermatology case. It obviously should be suitable for the journals. Uh, the clinical case report journals, it just clinical so it can publish anything in medicine so that's more broader uh, journal that can accept your dermatology uh, publications and then typically what I do is I start with the higher impact factor and I usually tell the medical students with me it depends if I feel that the medical students are still in they have one or two years before this they, they apply to derm which is typical in uh, Canada, I usually tell them, you know what, let's try higher impact journal. And if it doesn't take it, we have time to go over other journals, like because usually they take around four weeks to review and then they get back to us, they reject it. And then we, we rework it a little bit and then we send it to another journal. But if they, the medical student says, no, I want to get it published. We have, uh, I have timelines for my residency application. I try my best to make sure that it gets published before they apply to their derm residency and I help them as much as I can. So I know the journals that have a faster reviewer time and at the same time reviewing time and at the same time, they don't have the, the best impact factor. This is summary and suggested list for Durham journals. I'm sorry if there's anyone here who is not from the Durham field. I try to, I usually give this talk to other specialties. So what I did basically, I reworked everything to make sure it's completely Durham related so that you guys can correlate with me and understand what I'm talking about. So JAD case report, like for example, has a four impact factor. The European Journal of Dermatology has six impact factor. Nowadays, I noticed that the journals, they have their own journals like JAD, and then they have a journal that is called JAD case reports where they just accept case reports. The JAD, if you submit something to them, it's usually free. You don't have to pay any fees unless you wanna have like uh, more like, um, printed versions or you have like some online fast access, but usually it's free out of charge. When most of my publications with JAT, the other study designs, I didn't pay anything. But JAT case reports, they charge. And honestly, I think it's financial thing because JAT case reports, the, the Canadian Journal of Dermatology and the British Journal of Dermatology, they all have case reports. So they have their own journals, but they also have a journal for case reports. It makes it easy for you because they accept case reports and you have a case report, but at the same time, they charge a good amount of money, like $625. I didn't do the conversion to surgery, else, but you can do it. And then uh, basically, um, that's one of the challenging that I find with medical students, especially here that it charges like $895. That's too much, honestly, dollars for a case report just to publish it. And, uh, you know, you just have to look at the impact factor. So you can start with like something uh, difficult and then just go down if they reject it and rework it. Because sometimes they provide you with comments when they reject and sometimes they don't do. When they provide you with a comment, which is most of the times, because what's going to happen when you send your case reports, they can accept it from the beginning, which is rare or they're gonna send you something called minor revision or major revision. These can be positive, actually, feedback if you're getting it from a higher impact journal. Like let's say, for example, JAD sent you major revision. So that's great news because it means that they're gonna take it. I get a lot of students, they get really uh, sad when they receive major revision. So, oh, major revision, they're not gonna take it. No, they're actually interested in taking it, but they want you to revise the paper to do the changes that they want to make sure that you do them very well and point by point and address them to get it accepted. And honestly, sometimes I do not agree with the changes personally, but I adjust the changes because I'm working with the medical students and I don't wanna say like, no, I'm not gonna change this just to get it accepted. But right now, sometimes I do try to convince the reviewer if I have a point of view that I wanna keep and I don't wanna change, I usually tell them like, I prefer to keep this rather than changing it or I would remove it completely. So see, this is the same thing. When they send you the review, uh, the, the major revision, they're gonna tell you line 41, do not capitalize Supertiva. That one of the mistake I made. So basically what I did is I, the same revi uh, manuscript, I made all the changes and then I made a Word document called response to reviewers. And in the Word document, I just wrote like two lines. Thank you for spending the time to reviewing my uh, manuscript. Here is the response to your comments. And then I put it comment by comment. 
I don't usually change the color. Not everyone does, but yeah, you know, you could just put it like it, all black. And then I usually say, correct it. And I usually say, thank you for reviewing this. Great point. Thank you. Correct it. Please see the revised revision um, line number, whatever. Because when you make the changes in the revised revision, the um, in the revised version, sorry, the numbers of the lines will change. So you have to indicate the new number for the new line in that case. And that this is what you should do. So you have to keep track of the numbers and make sure that you adjust them. Some journals I noticed, but not all the time, they ask you to have the revised version tracked. And this is something you can do through Word document. You just put track and click yes. And any change you're gonna make, it will appear like it will show, it will be marked. So when you send them the revised revision, they will, um, the revised version, I don't know why I keep, keep saying the revised revision, the revised version, they will basically um, look up the attract points and comments, and then basically they will see what did you change in the paper. But again, you can do it as a separate document, which I do most of the time, and most journals want this version. But if you want to do it in the, in the Word document, Tracking, you can do it, it's a very easy topic. And sometimes, also rare, I've seen some journals that they ask you to highlight it, which is weird, but anyway, you can do that. I think it's the European Journal of Dermatology. They ask you to basically highlight the, uh, the changes that you made in the revised version. Is that clear? So my take home message from everything we discussed is basically your first case report will take a lot of time and a lot of effort and I remember for me, it took like two to three weeks and it was really difficult back and forth, had a lot of questions. I didn't know what running head means. I didn't know what is the uh, corresponding author means. I didn't know what is cover letter and how to write it. And I've never seen it before. I didn't know how to respond to the reviewers. I had a lot of struggles and challenges, but luckily I was with a good, um, supervisor who taught me everything and I'm hopefully guys with everything I tried to put in my, this presentation from my experience and also from my experience with reviewing other papers for other students would be beneficial for you when you write your case reports and hopefully you won't make the mistakes that I made before and it would be very uh, smooth and easy for you to get accepted and published and again if it doesn't get accepted from the first time try to rework it do not give up and submit it I remember one of the papers that I worked with the students um, get rejected like five times, but finally get accepted in a great journal. So that's great, you know, it takes some time. And if you wanna see like a full version of the manuscripts, you can go to a website that I um, use by most people. It's called ResearchGate. You will find all my publications here. Like um, uh, you can find other study designs, for example, like systematic review meta-analysis, if you want to, if you're interested to read about them. But for case reports, just read the full example of case reports, see how I formatted it. It's not ideal, but you could also read in the literature, for example, in the same journal that you're sending. This is another check I'm doing, is basically back in the days when I started writing case reports, I used to go to the journal and see that the case reports that they published, download them, print them and read them on my own, see how people are actually styling their case reports. And I tr tried to actually um, make mine look similar to them. So that was helpful, I find. And then I also do other research um, talks based on my master in epidemiology and biostat. And I'm actually, I was supposed to start my PhD this year, but I deferred my PhD to next year in master in um, biostat and epidemiology. So basically I do um, extensive talks on how to do critical appraisal of an article, which is basically if you have an article during your journal club and you wanna cl critically appraise the article and how to actually interpret the, um, statistical measures such as like the odds ratio, the relative risk, and what does that mean actually in clinical practice? And then also I, I went over how to write a review article, whether it's narrative or also systematic review on step-by-step, -step, it's very simple. And then how to conduct an effective uh, literature uh, search. And again, this is a big uh, different topic, which basically involves how to do a extensive literature review for um, systematic um, systematic review and meta-analysis is not the narrative simple one that usually we do for our simple case reports or case series for example 
And thank you so much for having me. I really am grateful to speak for the Derm Club. I spoke before on the Dermatology Residency in Canada. And now I have the opportunity to speak uh, their research um, webinar. And thank you so much for having me. And let me know, guys, if you have any questions. I'm happy to take them. يعطيك العافية دكتور بالعكس احنا اللي مبسوطين انه يو جوين ذس وان شاء الله ويل هاف يو جوين اس اجين باذن الله. في كم كويشن ان ذا كيو ان اي اف يو لايك مي تو ريد ذيم. يا شور. عليا اسكت وات شود اي رايت ان ذا ديسكشن اف اي هاف نو سيميلر ستدي تو كومبير ويز فور اكزامبل ذير واز نو سيميلر ستديز هافينغ ذا سيم سايد افكت بوست فايزر فاكسين. اوكي بيرفكت ذاتس ا جود كويشن. And it happens, it happens if you don't have, for example, similar case reports to this complication from vaccine. In my discussion, I would discuss more uh, basic science things that could relate to the uh, side effects from this vaccine. For example, if your side effects from this vaccine is articarial eruption, like articarial skin rash, I would, for example, say, well, looking to the ingredients of the vaccine, Uh, it contains this, 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 and that. And then basically I would put a reference for a scientific paper that discussed the content and the ingredients of the vaccine. And then I would go to the um, pathogenesis of articarial skin eruption. And I would say, well, the pathogenesis of articarial uh, eruption is basically due to mast cell release uh, and that will lead to blood vessel dilatation. And then I will put a reference for that. And then I will try to link them together. You are absolutely, absolutely free to um, make a new theory. However, you have to reference basic science information from about the, the ingredients, the mechanisms, how this vaccine led to this complication. This is what you're trying to discuss in your discussion. And it would be something by looking at the vaccine papers and seeing if there is anything that you can actually link to the complication and also finding referencing for the complication. Is that clear? And I know that you don't want to say what kind of vaccine or what kind of, I'm assuming it's COVID vaccine and what kind of complication, but honestly, if you want to email me and we can go over it, I'll try to see what can we, what can you discuss in the um, discussion part. Thank you, Dr. Bardo. Someone asked, in what journal would you recommend for a case report and literature review on sarcoidal ulcer? Uh, so, you know, the thing is with sarcoid, you know, that it's something very common and seen all the time. And uh, what makes sarcoidal ulcers different than other sarcoidal, um, with, with, than other ulcers, for example, I think if you have um, something interesting in the case, for example, if, I think the interesting points in that case would include uh, what makes the, the ulcer in sarcoidal lesions different than uh, other uh, ulcers. For example, is it like uh, longer to heal? Is it refractory to the traditional wound care uh, management that usually we take in ulcers? What makes uh, maybe if there is like a chronic granulomatous process in sarcoidal lesions that make the ulcer refractory Uh, to the traditional treatment that doesn't close. So I would find something interesting in the ulcer feature, number one. Number two is I will find something interesting in the treatment, like what else did you use for uh, ulcerated sarcoidal lesions that is not used, for example, for traditional ulcers and you feel that it helped. Or if you use, for example, for patients, um, um, systemic treatment and the ulcer healed, like this is how you're gonna go through it. But I, I think it's, if you find something interesting and it's never been discussed before and you found it like now it becomes more interesting, I would send it to JADCAS reports if that's okay. Um, it's fine if you pay, if you have funds for that. If it is not super, uh, you didn't find that something interesting in it and ulcerated sarcoidal lesions may not be that of great interest to the authors. So I would maybe send it to uh, Carger Dermatology They can charge as well. I'm not sure about their fee because it's not in dollars. It's a weird uh, currency, but they also charge. And I don't think they're really difficult. So I would send it to lower impact factor. But again, if you feel it's, you find something super interesting in the case, I didn't, I didn't read it. So it may go to higher impact journal. And also it depends on your time. If you want to wait, you can wait and try higher impact. You're not losing anything. The worst thing that will happen is that they're going to reject it. And then you're going to submit it to another journal. 
If you write it the same style that I went over today, basically the changes that you will make from one journal to another are minors, but be careful because I had students that made changes and they sent the paper and the cover letter to another journal and guess what? In the cover letter, the paper got rejected from um, JAD case reports and they sent it to the, um, the Canadian case reports. What did they do? They changed everything, but they forgot to change the line here, which is the American Academy of Judge Dermatology. So whoever read that paper or cover letter knew that these people already sent it to job case report and got rejected. This is a horrible mistake. Just try to be careful because also this happens. It happens by, it happened a lot. So that's why I'm just mentioning it. Just be careful about this. Everyone else is just saying thank you in the chat. Well, I say thank you, Kaman. Shukran Marra, and you joined us. And shukran to all the attendees who are here with us and share with us. I hope you enjoyed it all from the webinar. And inshallah, we will see you all again for another um, webinar activity. Good luck, everyone.